you know, we got this cool airplane here behind us, and we got a beautiful day. Would you like to go flying? Oh, would I like to go flying? Well, let's get <laughs> let's get it set up and go. We'll make a, uh, a little pass there for Pauline. Uh, Roger, I, I, I read you. Uh, Pauline, I'm in the back seat, coming by for a low-level pass. Wave as we go by, and do enjoy watching my flight. Now, Jim, tell me how you ended up as a mechanic with the 20th Pursuit Group down in the Philippines. Well, at, uh, I started out at Chinook Field in, uh, on my 18th birthday, June 12, 39. I was in Class 6 Air Mechanics there, which was the first accelerated class that they run on the build-up for World War II. Immediately on graduation, there were 66 of us shipped to the Philippines. Uh, in those days, if you lived east of the Mississippi, you had to go to Brooklyn, New York, and wait on your boat. And then you went down through the Panama Canal uh, to Frisco, changed boats, and went to the Philippines. I arrived there July the 20th, 1940, uh, in the uh, old uh, 20th Air Base Squadron, attached to the 28th Bomb Squadron uh, for uh, rations, orders, and uh, quarters. A uh, little uh, run-in with a, uh, a Roland Barnick, who later become uh, the last guy to fly the duck off, and I transferred to the 20th Pursuit Squadron at Nichols. That would have been on the first day of uh, March 1941, and it was with this unit till the end of the war. Now, what was life like uh, in the Philippines prior to December 7, 1941? Oh, that was good duty in those days. Uh, it was tropics, you know, and we couldn't stand the tropical heat in the afternoon. We only worked from about uh, 8 o'clock in the morning till noon. And then we were free to do things like ride the cavalry horses or play tennis or swim or all these uh, little uh, minor exercise activities, Job you know, perks. in the afternoon. <laughs> Uh, we had, uh, had had a pretty nice time prior to the war. What types of airplanes were there up to uh, uh, the, the Japanese attack on? What, what day was the Japanese attack in the Philippines? The, uh, the Japanese attack in the Philippines was on uh, December the 8th, uh, Philippine time. But prior to this, when I went in there in 1940, the 3rd Pursuit Squadron was equipped with the old uh, Boeing Peace Shooter, uh, built, I think, in 1931. The bomb squadron that I was attached to had 13 B-10B bombers. That was the Martin bomber. Uh, they had an OA-4 and an OA-9 observation amphibious. Uh, the second observation squadron was equipped with O-19 and O-46 aircraft. And then we had some miscellaneous traders, Stinsons and uh, Stearmans and things like that sitting around. And by the outbreak of the, the attack on December 8th, uh, what was the frontline fighters and what had you been working on? Well, we had started to build up. Uh, we had uh, uh, offloaded or something, a, a bunch of uh, P-35A aircrafts. And my squadron was the first squadron to have these. We turned our uh, uh, P-26 P-shooters over to the other squadrons coming in. And then after uh, we got rid of the uh, P-35s, we got the P-40B. That was the old uh, P-40 that had the 430, uh, 430 caliber machine guns in the wings, and it had 250s through the nose. Hmm. And then uh, we began to get the E-Series in, and the uh, 17th Squadron got rid of their P-35s, and, 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 uh, and the 3rd Pursuit Squadron were equipped with the E-models hmm. with the 650 calibers in, 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 the, in the wings. An interesting note on our B-models, we had a tech order change out of Wright-Patterson. We had to disconnect the, autom the hydraulic chargers for the uh, machine guns because it might possibly affect the landing gear uh, uh, retraction. So we had to plug the uh, hydraulic chargers. Well, as a consequence, when we went into combat, we'd get a jam in the air. We couldn't unjam the guns. The wheels would go up and down, but the guns wouldn't shoot. Uh, General Moore said he'd never come in from a combat mission 
except what he had to jam guns with ammunition in the boxes that he couldn't shoot. I'll be darned. And I guess uh, raising and lowering your gear for the Japanese didn't impress him. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> right, Pat seemed to think it was more important to get the gear down than it was to shoot the guns when you was in combat. I'll be darned. Well, at least you get the airplane back in one piece. Tell me a little bit about the story of the Candy Clipper. Well, the Candy Clipper, uh, it's, uh, it started out as a, uh, uh, a Navy airplane that was sitting on the west edge of Marvelous Bay. And uh, my, my field during the war was Marvelous the Strip there, Marvelous Field. And the Japanese had machine gunned and sunk three of these, um, uh, what is it, J2Fs or yeah, F2Js J2 uh, slash twos. And one was a little higher up than the others, and the, 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 the hull was the only thing that was submerged, and the other two, the engines, were in the water. Well, my squadron uh, took a block and tackle and uh, drug this one plane out of the uh, bay, and we uh, r uh, drained the water out of the hull and patched some holes with some inner tubes, and then we refloated it and took it over to our runway, which almost run into the bay, not quite, but almost. How far of a, a float trip was that? Oh, no, I can't. Not, not too. Half not a that, mile? Oh, probably not that far. Hmm. So now, Jim, once the duck was brought out of the water and you floated it over to the base, what, uh, what transpired at that point? Well, uh, the first thing, we had to get it out of the water onto the runway, and a construction crew brought a, a big uh, uh, hoist uh, crane and lifted it out of the water and set it on the runway. Uh, then we drug it into one of our revetments we'd built and, uh, and started the rebuilding of it, patching the holes, getting the barnacles off of it, uh, going through the engine, the propeller, and this sort of thing. Unfortunately, uh, I was made a member of the uh, 71st Provincial Infantry and went out to, to stem off a Jap invasion. And uh, General Moore, the guy that flew the duck, uh, uh, he alternated commands with uh, Hank Thorne, and every other day he was the command of the uh, of the beach defense, and the next day he would go in and, and take, do the duties on, on, on Marvellous Field. But um, uh, a lot of this restoration was done while I was out there on the beach, but uh, I do remember uh, working on the engine, standing on the, on the hull of the thing and doing a little work on the engine and uh, helping scrape some of the barnacles. I guess it had set in the water for a month or six weeks before we hauled it out. But anyhow, uh, so this would have been uh, sometime in January of 42. If my memory serves me right, uh, the uh, duck was probably sunk in early December of 41, and we probably drug it out in early February of 42 and uh, started the restoration on it. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the rumors is, I, I don't have this confirmed, but one of the living members of the squadron says we used uh, the tops and bottoms out of canned uh, goods to patch the bullet holes. <laughs> and there's another rumor that I don't really know it's true, but I'm inclined to think it is, that the wheel bearings were so badly damaged uh, by setting in the salt water that we remachined the hubs to accept truck, truck bearings and to get the thing rolling on smooth ball bearings. But anyhow, uh, we, we did the restoration there in the squad. Oh, that's great. Now, your, your specialty was actually uh, doing engine changes and working on engines. Uh, my specialty when I graduated was everything from the prop spinner to the uh, elevator and uh, aileron uh, tabs on the back end. But in the 20th squadron prior to the war, I was in the engineering section and Kenneth E. Stanford, William J. Joy and I did all of the engine changes in the, in the 20th squadron. The crew was relieved when they hit the hangar door. And after we installed the engine, took them out and serviced them and run them up, then it's turned back to the crew. Hmm. That's one of General Moore's innovations that I think really paid off. Oh, neat. It would take a crew maybe two weeks reading tech orders to change an engine. And uh, the first engine we changed, it took uh, maybe a 16-hour day. And uh, then uh, before we, uh, we changed every engine in the squadron except Joe's old number 41. But before we got done, we were swinging two engines a day, working about 14 hours, the three of us. Unbelievable. How long did it take for them to get the airplane to where it was ready to fly? I'm going to suggest it was a couple of three weeks we worked on it. And when we finally had it, uh, had it ready, I really think that it was to give, biz, uh, give uh, hands or something to do that we started the project because nobody thought we could ever accomplish it. But once we had it rebuilt, uh, uh, our squadron commander, uh, Captain Moore was very, very pleased with the look of it. He went out 
uh, very late one afternoon and test hopped it. And oh, we were so proud to hear that thing purr and to hear him take it off. And he got out over Manila Bay and done a few things and come in and landed. And then we serviced the airplane. And at four o'clock the next morning, he, along with uh, Lieutenant Bill Cummings, took off for Cebu on the first flight out with it. Now, how far away was that? Oh, Jesus, I don't know. He left at four o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> he intended to get in at daylight, uh, if he make the flight at night, uh, but... Uh, and why did he make the flight at night? Well, to keep the Jap Zeros from shooting him down. Uh, we only had one uh, flexible gun in the back end, a uh, 30 caliber machine gun for protection, but he had to actually talk to the Navy pilot that had flown this plane. And this cat had given him uh, some uh, uh, figures to go by. He said the plane would cruise at 110 knots. They gave him the landing and takeoff speed because Joe had never flown an amphib. And Joe figured his flight to just get in and make uh, his landing at Cebu at, at daylight so he wouldn't have to be uh, in, uh, out exposed to the Japs. But the only thing he could get out of the old bird was about 90 knots. So he, uh, he was uh, daylight was about an hour before he made his landing at Cebu. Ooh. And he said he cut a few donuts on his parachute on the way in, but they did get in okay. After they landed, I, I, Joe had took the squadron roster and he and Cummings sorted mail. It was Christmas time. And, well, it was after Christmas, but it was Christmas mail. And he got a letter from everybody in the squadron he could find letters for. And I had two letters from my fiance, my present wife, Pauline. And then he brought back it was seven or 8,000 quinine pills and then some food. Really? And, uh, it was really a, a wonderful trip back because it saved so many lives by getting this quinine back to us. What was it like on life on uh, Bataan there? Well, when we got down into Bataan, uh, this was the old orange plan that was uh, devised shortly after Dewey made his landing over there in 18 and 98. But we went on half ration shortly after we got down there. I got down there on uh, uh, Christmas Day of 1941. And uh, we went on half rations, and then very shortly after that, we went on quarter rations, and then we went on fifth rations. And the last ration I had before we surrendered, there was seven cans of salmon, the little 14-ounce cans of salmon, and four four-pound loaves of a quartermaster field bread that was tore up and put in this cauldron, and they carefully measured the water to give each one of us a half a canteen cup of of this gruel, that was the last food we got. And uh, as we'd go by, uh, uh, we'd say, stir, damn you, stir, <laughs> to these cooks. But prior to this, we had eaten all the cavalry horses, we'd eaten all the pack train mules, and then it was the snakes, the lizards, the dogs, the monkeys, the roots that were edible, and then there wasn't anything left. At what time, what time, when was the surrender? The surrender was April of the 9th, 1942. I'll be darned. And then the death march run from that time, I, I started on the death march on uh, April 11th, a 65-mile walk. I finally got into the first prison camp on April the 21st. But during the actual 65-mile march, I think it run from the 11th till the 18th of uh, April. And the Japs gave me two balls of rice, and that's all the food that they give me for the entire march. And then uh, they refused us water at the free-flowing artesian wells, and we could dip water out of the ditches and stuff. And uh, this is one of the reasons so many, many hundreds of us died. Hmm. Hmm. And what happened to you uh, after the march? Well, uh, right after the march, I went into Camp O'Donnell. That was the first camp. There was roughly 5,000 of us who got in there early. There was one water, one water spigot for the 5,000 guys. And uh, there was a line 24 hours a day there to fill the canteens. But I volunteered for a water carrying detail. We'd go down to the river and bail up five gallon gas cans of water and bring them in for the cooks to use for cooking to save the, the tap water. And uh, we were so weak by this time, it took two guys to carry a five, can, a five gallon can of gas. That would have been something like 50 pound on a bamboo pole. Mm -hmm. And uh, from there I went to Gapan, Novacia to rebuild a bridge that we had blown. There was 200 of us went out on this job. 
And uh, I think uh, we were there six weeks, and uh, but then 80-some guys had died, and we went back into Commander Dewan camp. And then early in, um, in October of 42, I was one of 2,000 men that was shipped out on the old uh, Totoro Maru uh, L ship, ending up in Mugden, Manchuria. Hmm. We had a large modern machine tool factory. We went up there to, to slave labor in. You had an interesting story before that you told me about your mother's wedding ring. Yes, my mother uh, died suddenly in 39. And for some reason, uh, she, uh, she was only uh, uh, maybe 10 minutes dying because of previous breast cancer. But anyhow, she said, Jim, I'll, my dad, take my wedding band off. And if, if a bus's bride would choose to wear it, I want her to wear it with my prayers that their life will be as happy and productive as, I, as ours has been. Well, I had this ring around my neck on a, on a chain when I surrendered. And when we surrendered on Marvelous Field, the Japanese put blankets in front of us. And under the penalty of death, we were to put any item of kin, that's gold, on the blanket. Well, I wasn't about to put mother's ring on the blanket. I was engaged to my present wife of 57 years, Pauline. So I taped it under my armpit. Well, the second day on the death march, a Jap Naval Force guard found it, and I thought he was going to kill me. I kept a spitting on myself and crossing myself and saying, my mother, my mother dead. Well, I don't know why I did this spitting. I've just seen it in movies sometime. But anyhow, this Jap looked at me, and he says, oh, mama, mama, oh, worry, mama, oh, worry. I didn't know what Mama O'Worry meant, but I, I decided it was a good time for me to agree with him. So he told me to tape the ring just above my anus that no Jap guard would ever feel there. And I wore that ring there for weeks and weeks and weeks. Uh, and I did get home with it. And my wife has worn it now for 57 years. And how long were you in a POW camp? Well, about three and a half years. <sighs> I was liberated on um, August the 15th, 1945, captured on... April the 9th, 1942, and one of my biggest gripes <clears throat> when I was liberated, the beloved government that I had fought so hard for took from August the 15th to November the 2nd to get me home, and there was airplanes coming back virtually empty. Jeez. Huh. But uh, that being as it may, <laughs> I did get back. Now, to your recollection, um, when we originally had the airplane restored, we saw a picture of it painted in these colors. And to your knowledge, actually, it was named the Candy Clipper, but I think it was an artist, uh, uh, some artistic license. That the candy cane actually was not on the original no, airplane. No, 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 no. Hell, we didn't have any insignias or anything else. We didn't have anything to work with on the top. We was even putting fabric patches on aluminum skins on leading edges of, of airplane wings to cover up uh, bomb holes. Gee. Uh, one of the most interesting things I was involved in, we had uh, a P-40 come in and land, and uh, one propeller had been nicked on the trailing edge with a bullet, and uh, it was just damn near to shake the engine out of the frame. And uh, he rolled it in there, and old Beeler Jordan, who was our line chief, he looked at her and says, uh, Get me a tape measure, get me a half round bastard file, a piece of chalk. Well, they went and got it. And he measured up to where this nick was out of it. And he took this f file and he smoothed it off. And then the old feller took the next blade and measured up exactly the same place. And he made another notch. And the third prop the same way. And he said, start it up. And there was a slight vibration and it shut it down. He went to one blade, and I got it. We had sophisticated dynamic balances for prop, <laughs> and you're he out here in the He's jungle. He's eyeballing it. He'd eyeballed it, and he never gave his secrets, and I wondered how in the hell he knew which blade to touch up, but he had put chalk marks on different positions on the three blades, and I guess he could see the blade vibrating and had this chalk mark because he knew just exactly. I'll be darned. But anyhow, we fired it up and flew it. Tell me any uh, experiences you had and recollections with the P-35. Well, I was uh, made an instrument specialist when we got the P-35s in. 
I was at Nichols Field, and the depot was right there at Nichols Field. And uh, the 35s had all metric instruments in them. And my job was to go in and, uh, and change the, uh, uh, the metric instruments into each system, the altimeters, the uh, pressure gauges that was in kilos and all this Air crap. Speed. Uh, th that's what I did. Uh, and uh, I could stand corrected, but I believe we changed the wing, ro wing root structure of ours to put uh, twin 50s in the wings. They didn't have any guns on them, as I remember. Hmm. And uh, the, we assembled them there. And uh, then uh, the, my squadron was the first bunch to have them. And then we passed them on. They went through a couple other squadrons during uh, the evolution. Who had them and how many were there uh, on the uh, December 8th on the Philippines? I would like to think there was probably as many as 20 or 25 still flying on December the 8th. Hmm. Uh, we, used, uh, we, we used them to drop frag bombs with the 25-pound frag bombs. You could put a whole covey of bombs under the wings of the things, and uh, we used them for courier. The jet for landing uh, at Lingayen Bay, and we was making runs, strafing runs, and bombing runs up there. There's about 90 transports uh, offloading thousands and thousands of crack uh, uh, battle-hardened troops uh, on that original landing. Tell me a little bit about the ship that they used to do the night machine work on. <laughs> that was the old Canopus. The uh, Canopus was a submarine tender, and she was quite a boat. She had sophisticated uh, gear aboard, but the Japs had hit her and put her out of commission, and, and we scuttled her, run her aground there at Marvelous, very close to our field. And the Japs was continuing to bomb her. So the Navy uh, jury rigged a bunch of tanks of gasoline and, uh, and oil and stuff and tires and make black smoke, and they covered it with a tarpaulin. And just as the Japs released their bombs, they set this afire, and the black smoke started billowing out and it burnt the tarpaulins up. And then when they got done, they'd put a bunch of old uh, uh, scrap steel and stuff on it. It looked like it was completely uh, done and done. So then we kept, uh, nobody was allowed around the thing in the daytime, but at nighttime it was a beehive of activity where they were running the machine shops to do the, do the heavy work and stuff we needed there on Bataan. Oh, we, excuse me, we call her the Canopus, but uh, the real name was the Canopus. So you guys actually staged an explosion with some well, tires the, and... The, the Navy did. The uh, Navy yeah, did. Yeah. We had quite a Navy complement there on Marvelous. We had Navy tunnels with ammunition. We had the Canopus there and uh, uh, quite, quite a Navy complement there on, on, on the shore. Jim, tell me where you were and what your impressions were on December 8th at the attack in the Philippines. <laughs> Damn disappointing. Uh, I was working on an engine in the hangar uh, uh, and uh, I heard this earth shaking vibration and I run out to the door of the hangar and coming from the north was 54 twin engine beddies in two echelons in perfect formation. Well, I headed for the supply hangar. We're supposed to draw a rifle and some ammunition and head for Foxhole when the siren went off, but the damn siren hadn't even went off. But anyhow, I got my rifle and my ammunition, and I'd started, to, we had a zigzag trench by our base operations that I was going to, was supposed to be in, but the bombs was falling, and I dived in a partially dug foxhole and was damn near covered up with a bomb, and didn't even bust my eardrums, but uh, this throwed dirt all over me. Well, some old World War I type Sergeant hollered gas and caused a hell of a lot of uh, problems because it was just the smell of the bombs going off. But uh, in the lull, I got to my uh, foxhole, and uh, then after the, uh, maybe two waves of bombers hit Clark, 90 zero fighters come in, and they just literally riddled the place. And I was laying in this uh, uh, zigzag trench with my back to the way they was coming in, and then as they passed over, I was shooting at him with an old 30 off 6 Springfield, and I could hear myself today saying, now Jim, damn it, you got to lead a duck, so lead these a little further. <laughs> Bam, pow, 
bam, bam, bam. And I don't know where they're getting or not, but I had a hell of a lot of fun shooting. I'll be darned. Smoked Jeez. about a pack of cigarettes during that hour, too. Unbelievable. I can imagine. I would have started anyway. <laughs> well, after the uh, lull, uh, General Moore, uh, Captain Moore, our squadron commander, pulled all of us with our uh, shelter half and our gas masks and stuff, and we went and spent the night in a, along a, 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 an old dirt road. And then the next morning, we started pulling ourselves together and started getting organized to fight a war. And my squadron was bivouacked about three kilometers from the field on the old Spanish trail above Fort Sotzenberg. And we would uh, bivouac up there, and then we'd ride before daylight down to the field. Well, the hangars were all blowed up, but we had made a bunch of paper airplanes with propellers that actually turned in the wind. Hmm. And the Japs would strafe, 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 strafe these planes sitting on these wooden poles. And we had our airplanes in a little woods back tail back into the jungle with netting over them. And they never dropped a damn bomb in that place. But we'd, at night, we'd rebuild, the engineers would rebuild these paper planes. Next morning, boom, 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 <laughs> here we go again. Wasting their and, ammunition. Uh, <laughs> but uh, that, that was the way we started out at Clark Field. Jeez. We fought there from um, December the 8th uh, till December the 24th, and was ordered to move out to go down into Bataan. On Bataan, our first bivouac was out under the uh, uh, rainforest jungle, and we didn't have any equipment. We had uh, no tents. We had I had a shelter half and a blanket, and we slept out under the trees. And our galley was a bunch of tarpaulins stretched among trees. The guys would cook underneath these tarpaulins. We had no salt, so we would bring seawater in to cook the food in the seawater to get a little bit of salt in it. Well, Jim, I tell you what, uh, you know, we got this cool airplane here behind us and we got a beautiful day. Would you like to go flying oh, in it? Oh, would I like to go flying? Well, let's get, <laughs> let's get it set up and go. So, Jim, you think this is going to work okay for you? It might be the player of my lifetime. Well, that's cool. We'll find we'll find a place to strap that uh, oxygen bottle so you can actually uh, do some flying while we're up there. Okay. Good deal. I'll get Jack to help you with that, and then I'll get does up in the fly, front. Does it fly any ways like a 175A? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs>
We'll make a, uh, a little pass there for falling. Uh, Roger, I, I, I read you. Uh, Pauline, I'm in the back seat, coming by for a low level pass. Wave as we go by. And do enjoy watching my flight. This is outstanding, sir. Yeah, don't worry about the slip ball back there. Just fly by the seat of your pants. You might have to have a little bit of left aileron on in. You got it. It's not the nicest flying thing, and a fly, it feels better from the front seat. That stick is too short in the back. Okay, I've done it. Now it's back to you. Okay, I got it. I can tell Joe I didn't fly. Nice, man. Yeah, I'm gonna be taking off here out of this turn. You'll never know how much an old soldier has appreciated these two days. Hey, I appreciate all you guys did. I mean, you guys, I live in a great free country that you guys defended. I couldn't do this if you guys hadn't done what you did. Okay, here we go. We're going to take it in.